Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the What the Research Says, a week in the life of an academic video game collection webinar with Diane Robeson, a games and education librarian at the University of North Texas, and Emily Pajman, media circulation manager at the University of North Texas. My name is George Bergstrom, and I'm the Southwest Regional Coordinator from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I'll be the question moderator today. We're also happy to announce that our co-sponsor for today's webinar is the American Library Association's Games and Gaming Roundtable. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few announcements. To register for other webinars or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov library. This session is one hour, and so you'll receive one LEU for today. If you are watching the archived recording of this webinar, the instructions on how to obtain your LEU are available in the video's description on YouTube. Or you can also find those instructions on the Indiana State Library's continuing education site under the LEU policies. I will now turn the presentation over to Diane and Emily. Great. Hi, I'm Diane Robson, the Games and Education Librarian, and with me is Emily Boyman, the Media Circulation Manager. We manage the game collections and spaces at the University of North Texas. And today I'll give you a brief overview of the media library staffing related to the game collection management, our collections and spaces, and then Emily will lead you through a week in the life. So the University of North Texas Library supports about 50,000 students, faculty, and staff across three different campuses. The media library on the main Denton campus houses the audiovisual film and game collections. The game collection supports game research, instruction, and play, and includes about 1,800 video and PC games, about 900 tabletop games, several giant games, and role-playing guides. It provides access to gaming PCs, VR devices, consoles, and game accessories. The media library is staffed by three librarians, three full-time support staff, and about 10 student assistants. The media head manages the media library as a whole. We have a film and digitization librarian who manages our film collections and a film and video outreach coordinator who manages streaming licensing, ordering films, and a few other tasks related to that collection. The group that manages the media library, gaming spaces, and the collections is a media services manager, the media circulation manager, Emily, and me, the games and education librarian. Because we have a small staff, we all help with everything, especially events which can, which can be sometimes an all hands on deck event. Our media access services manager manages everything front desk and students. This person manages student staffing, ensures students are all trained, and the materials are circulating properly. Emily is a media circulation manager and works with this services manager and the student assistants to manage bookings, room reservations, overdue items, fines, and the game space. I oversee all the processes related to the game collection from purchasing new materials to cataloging to developing the procedures for processing and circulation and to overseeing the game space management. Everyone in the library learns how to work at the front desk and basic troubleshooting for both film and game. The key element of our day to day success is our student assistance. We couldn't get everything done unless we had their support. So game collections are growing in academic libraries, but there's still a big reluctance for some libraries to accept them. According to the Entertainment Software Association, the US video game industry is a 60 or $90 billion industry now with an annual economic output in 2019. Universities are starting to see the value of supporting coursework that prepares students to be in this industry and have careers. And these careers can span from designing games all the way to project management and just helping manage the companies themselves. Beyond the economic impact is how much the game industry is really really affecting our culture. Games are everywhere in our lives. UNT began its collection in about 2009 with $500 to support a campus-wide student initiative called Howdy Week. This was our freshman welcome event, and it was a perfect opportunity to, to introduce the games to the libraries. The collection started with a few consoles, controllers, and video games. But over the past 14 years, it's grown. It now includes games that support research, instruction, and recreation across our campus. The collection includes games that support DEI initiatives, training, and wellness, games by diverse authors and from different cultures and countries, games for the blind and adaptive devices for those with mobility issues. These help include increase inclusion in your spaces. 
and games to support a recent growth in instruction around game design, narrative, culture, and history on our campus. The collection includes not only modern consoles, but also legacy consoles to support content that spans the history of gaming. Everything you need to play the games we purchase is available either for checkout or use in the media, media library. So as I mentioned, we started our game budget with a budget of just $500. That's all we had to start the collection. But during the 14 years, our budgets rose and fell as the economy and our enrollment changed. We had some really lean years where there was zero money and we used donations. And then other years where giant buckets of money fell on us. So it was very plentiful. And we used those um, years of money to expand the collection out and, and fill any gaps from our lean years. So our content is purchased much like DVDs through our media library materials budget. We have a set amount in that each year. Items pur purchased specifically for classes that comes from a general larger library budget. Periodicals, books, and ebooks are also purchased through this general library budget. Equipment has its own yearly budget that I manage. I keep a real tight control of that budget because I need to ensure that I have enough money for new materials, but also to replace anything that's broken or worn out. We have a supply budget and it includes things like cables, bags, and processing materials. So that's a whole separate budget line. Um, and the Media Access Services Manager and I work closely to make sure we have everything we need to make sure things circulate effectively. And that can be the cables and bags, but it's also just things to label your items and tags and just all the little doodads it takes to make things circulate. So I'm not shy about asking about money. Emily can let you know that. <laughs> I plan what I want. I have lots of lists of what I want and what we need. Um, I have goals that I want to achieve. I list those goals out. So I'm always asking for money. And we have always had good support and I've always had money um, given to me because of my preparation ahead of time. And these funds have been on top of our regular budget. So always, always ask for what you want. The worst that can happen is someone will say no. Okay, for 10 years, we've slowly morphed the media library space from a quiet viewing space into a gaming space with consoles, PCs, and a growing collection of video and tabletop games. We were able to do this because a lot of video went online into streaming platforms. In 2018, the media library was renovated with the support of the UNT Student Affairs, and this was to support research, recreational gaming, and esports. So the media commons includes PCs, consoles, and tabletop games. Several PC stations in the Commons have cameras mounted to support the HTC Vive and the Valve Index VR headsets. The Nest is dedicated solely to PC gaming. The space was created to support the esports team, but is now used for recreation and can be reserved by gaming student groups. Esports has its own dedicated gaming space now, and it has a great Rocket League team and also competes in Valorant, Overwatch, and League of Legends. Some of our goals align with this group, so we still work closely with them, promoting gaming across campus. Our screening room is used for film screenings and instruction, and this is where we house our legacy console collection. It's in several blocking media cabinets. Anyone using our space can reserve it either by seat or the entire space to use our equipment. All tables are first come first serve, so people can come in and just play or study at their leisure. At this time, this, we use SpringShare's LibCal to manage the spaces. Um, reservations ensure that they have their spot but they also provide statistics for our reporting. So we purchase all the necessary equipment to play all of our game content. So we have game consoles that span from 1977 to modern consoles. We have controllers, steering wheels, joysticks, simulators, and PCs. And much of what we use is on a network. We work closely with the Library Technology and Computer Operations Department, LibTaco, to make sure that the equipment we purchase works with the university's network and meets their security needs. I run all smaller equipment purchases, like our Steam Decks, any haptic devices or peripherals through them before I purchase it to make sure they fit in the parameters that are needed. Bigger purchases, like PCs, are bigger discussions that include the media head and the division head and the head of this department and the dean. And those are sort of on a rotating basis and we keep it in our, our uh, plan of when we need to, to reorder PCs or update equipment. LibTaco has a Teams channel for all things technical in the library. And we have a smaller hidden channel within that to talk about our problems. Um, 
we don't have a lot of problems in our space, even though everything is networked, we um, meet them about halfway and we can troubleshoot and take care of most issues by ourselves. So that leaves the bigger issues for them, which would be re-imaging PCs each semester or each year, managing our ethernet ports. Um, most of them are on all the time, but sometimes something happens and we have to get them turned back on. Um, consoles are assigned to the MAC address. So everything is assigned so someone else can't plug in and use the ports. And there are any bigger software issues they take care of. We have a really good relationship with this department and we're lucky that most of them do play games. So they understand what we're talking about and they're enthusiastic about what we're doing. Emily will discuss technical needs later and how we use our tech ticketing system to work with them. So the media library started small hosting events and it was to promote our collections and spaces. We're sort of hidden where we are now. But now our events are bigger and they include open play, themed play, facilitated play, escape rooms, film screenings, and reference sessions. Over the years, we've networked and engaged all over campus to build relationships with departments like student affairs and residence life. And this has led to a big increase in our visibility. And we're now seen as a partner for campus-wide events and we're the place to go when people need expertise in game-related resources. Online play is also a way to have events. It has made our collection more accessible to those not on or unable to come to campus. In early 2020, we began discussing Discord. We really wanted a channel and we wanted to promote play in that channel. COVID pushed us right into that. We hosted all of our events for almost two years in our Discord channel. Now we use these channels to post about events, answer reference and collection questions and engage online with play, we play in there. Um, many game platforms offer, offer multiplayer options so you can play together online. On this slide, you can see an epic gnome run in the world of Warcraft, a capture from a streamed game on where we played Among Us, a D&D group on Twitch, a single player roller coaster tycoon stream into Discord, and a picture of Scrappy getting my character killed as we chase ghosts in Phasmophobia. Our film and outreach coordinator monitors our Discord channels. She answers any questions that need to be answered, and she also makes sure that people are following the UNT Student Code of Conduct. So even though we do a lot of recreational gaming in our space, we also use it for research and instruction. We have classes from colleges and departments across campus using our video and tabletop games. Some of the classes are about game history and design with this top photo showing a class on the history of video game consoles. This year, a fashion design class started to use tilt brush and VR to design the first iteration of gowns they would later make as a final project. And we support neurodiverse students in a lot of different student groups and through some programs on campus. We create breakouts and escape rooms that meet some of the scenario, meet the goals that they have in their spaces. We also support classes that include any game elements. There's a history class right now that's using Red Dead Redemption for a class in the Hollywood in the Wild West. And often these courses are patrons first introduction to the media library and games and virtual reality. So it's a really fun thing to participate with. <laughs> So we're all pretty awesome here and you can tell from our top photo in here, but not everyone understands what we're trying to do. So we do have an elevator speech that we use when we're working with others. It's really important to um, talk about, to shift how you talk about your collections when you're with different types of groups. If you're talking to students, you might speak differently than when you talk with faculty or administration. Um, how you speak about your collection and the things that you emphasize can greatly affect its outcome. So take time to think about how you wanna be represented um, with these groups and especially in your outreach, you want a consistent message across everything. And the words you use really do matter when you wanna see um, the outcomes for your department because a lot of people still don't see the value in it. So you really need to make it shine. So my last slide is about statistics. The stats shown here are pre-COVID. We're just now returning to our regular level of patrons in our spaces. Keeping statistics is really important. These stats kept us alive through some very tough times recently with budget and space issues. And um, we keep stats on attendance, usage of materials, reference questions, troubleshooting tasks and who is using our space. We gather information about classes that use or teach about games on campus, any faculty that teach or use games on campus, any game related student groups. We keep track of reservations. Did they just need our materials? Or are they using our space? Are we actually troubleshooting? Are we facilitating play within the class or event? Beyond just regular stats that we keep is a university card swipe system. We use it generally just for head count, but you can also gather diversity, class majors, graduation, do they live on or off campus? You can get a lot of information from that. So now I'm gonna hand you off to Emily, who's gonna lead you through a day in the life of our collection. All 
All right. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, well, I'm Emily Poyman. I'm the Media Circulation Manager. I know two days are alike in UNT's media library. So in the following slides, I will go ahead and discuss our library policies and the reality of the day-to-day -day workflow. The Media Library's email account is the main point of communication for most faculty, student, and community requests. I manage the account and I direct emails to the appropriate media staff to answer them. The requests that I handle personally are general reference questions, fines, media bookings, room reservations, and student organization requests. We often receive questions from patrons asking for basic information about our library hours, the services that we offer, and how they can access a certain game or film. Our digitization and streaming services are popular among our UNT faculty. And so these questions are forwarded to our media and digitization librarian and our film and video outreach coordinator. Examples of questions like this include, can you digitize this VHS tape and make it available for streaming? The license on this video has expired. Can you send me new links for my Canvas course? Or I'm looking for this rare film, can you help me? And being a well-established media library, occasionally we do get asked for advice from other universities interested in building their own collection. So just last month, the National Library and Archives of Quebec in Canada asked about our library, our process of checking for missing pieces in board games and if we weigh them to control loss, which we do. We also have been asked for our policy and procedures documentation on loaning out tabletop games. And when I receive these questions, if I can't answer them myself, I'll send them to Diane. Fine disputes are some of the most common requests that are found in the inbox. Students will submit them through the UNT Library's website. And our policy is to provide a courtesy fine waiver for first time requests. Future requests are up to the library's discretion, but since media fees do add up at $5 a day for equipment and $1 a day for games and DVDs, I will typically reduce these down to something manageable or I'll just waive them if there's no prior abuse of the system. And a one day grace period means that fines don't show up on a patron's account until items are returned at least two days late. Each time a fee gets waived or it's reduced, I place a note on the patron's account, and this helps a prevent a system abuse. Once these fees exceed $50, the patron is blocked from checking out materials from any of the UNT libraries on our campus until they get taken care of. When items are overdue, patrons will receive two automated email notices before the item gets billed to their account. And I will also reach out to the patron personally, first by email and eventually by phone. Most of the times things do come back, but sometimes we get some excuses. Like, I gave it to my friend to return while I was out of state, or my stomach hurt that day, or my dog ate it. These are all real, real examples of emails I've received in the Media Library account. We offer booking services for faculty wanting to use our materials for class instruction. And these take precedence over holds, and the process differs in that materials can be scheduled for specific dates, weeks, or even months in advance. Some professors will send us um, their syllabus at the beginning of the semester with the dates films or games will need to be covered in class, and I can easily book everything at once. When a hold is activated, the patron has between three and five days to pick up their requested items before they're put back into circulation. But with bookings, there's a bit more leniency and I can modify them as needed. Many faculty members will use our collection to supplement their coursework. Um, so the media arts department is among our top users of this service. And faculty can request these materials through UNT's online catalog where they're asked to provide details like the period of time the item is needed and if they would like to deliver it, have it delivered to their office. We have student couriers that will deliver and pick up these materials. I keep track of the daily bookings through our circulation system, along with an Excel spreadsheet. If an item is returned to the library within one week of its booked date, a pop-up message will show up on check-in. And this signals to the library staff to set the item aside on our booking shelf until it's time for the item to go out again. UNT departments and student organizations can also book games for their planned events. So gaming events are a really popular way to bring students in and many groups will often ask for either a Wii or a Switch console 
so they can host Mario Kart tournaments or just dance parties. We also have a selection of giant games, and these are highly circulated, especially our Connect Four and our giant Jenga. To schedule these bookings, event organizers will email the library directly. We have three different spaces in the media library that can be reserved. Media professors and events related to film and gaming are prioritized, um, and these spaces include our screening room, which can be used to show films, host classes. This room can seat up to 40 people comfortably. Then our Nest is our eSports lounge, and it has our Alienware PCs. The Media Commons is a mixed space used with a mixed use space with PCs, game consoles, and tables for tabletop games or for studying. Faculty, staff, and official student organizations can reserve seats or entire spaces for their activities, course, or events. These reservations are sent to the media library email. I then make sure the requirements for the space requests have been met, and then I reserve the space for them. Some of the questions that I will ask are if they're an official student group, faculty, or staff member. When do they need the space? Do they need materials booked? Will they need any technical support? And will there be food involved? Technical support is typically only provided for classes or for special events. UNT encourages our students to organize and lead student organizations related to their, to their interests. These organizations are managed by the Student Activities Department in the Division of Student Affairs. An official student organization is registered with this department, and we have about 450 groups on campus. Student orgs can request access to host events through the UNT OrgSync online community portal. They also will email the media library to get approval for space usage. If the faculty advisor and student activity schedulers approve the events, they can then host them in campus spaces. And we try our best to support any game-related student groups stu and groups hosting game activities. Engaging with these groups is beneficial to our campus presence. These groups have been the catalyst behind much of the growth of our collection. LibCal is the system that we use for reserving PC stations, console gaming stations, and virtual reality devices. Students can book individual seats for up to four hours daily. And these stations can be booked up to 72 hours in advance, online or in person through QR codes that are posted around our library. So in the Nest, we have 15 different stations, all our Alienware PCs, which are um, really good gaming computers. And then in the Media Commons, we also have Alienware PCs. There are six stations total, and this, in this includes our Valve Index VR station. We also have a bunch of console gaming stations. So we have 12 different TVs and about two consoles per station, which makes for 22 consoles. And then we also have tables for study or tabletop gaming. The media library staff can use LibCal to book multiple consoles or the entire space days, weeks, or months in advance for events and classes. So for example, we host a video game histories class a few times a semester. I will use LibCal to reserve those game consoles for the games that the professor will be teaching that day. And we also make sure that these games are available if we have them in our collection to play that day. And this brings me to the topic of circulation. Following a slowdown from the pandemic, the 2022 to 2023 school year has really seen an increase in the usage of the media library, both in the space and in the circulation of our materials. UNT students and faculty can borrow equipment such as consoles, controllers, video games, tabletop games, and films to take home. Our checkout procedures are very similar to books. We just have a couple more components to scan. So for students, the loan period is three days. They can check out three different items at a time, and they do have, there's a fine system. So it's a dollar a day for games and DVDs, and then $5 a day for equipment. With faculty and staff, our loan period is seven days, and they can check out up to 10 items at a time, and there are no fines. If there is no hold on an item, a patron can renew DVDs and video games up to one time online, and the next time they want to renew it, the item has to be brought back into the media library and renewed in person. Equipment and tabletop game renewals must always occur in person with the item present. A media staff will check in each component 
and scan it back out to the patron if there are no holds on it. At this time, the Media Library has closed stacks, um, but students can search our catalog for items or scan one of the QR codes that we have, um, which takes them right to a limited catalog search for each topic or game format. In the next year, our collection will be moving into a space with open stacks, and to help bring awareness to our collection and allow for browsing, we have started moving some of our materials out onto the floor. In our closed stacks, we have our DVDs, our game consoles, video games, tabletop games, and controllers. And then the open stacks include our role-playing guides, tarot cards, dice, as well as role-playing figures. Our check-in procedures are pretty straightforward. In a perfect world, a patron will return all the items in on time with all of their parts. The staff will check these items in and the item gets reshelved. Patrons are asked to remain at the circulation desk while items are being checked in to avoid any discrepancies or missed items. And this can take a little bit of time, but overall, it's the best way. Our student assistants run an overdue list each morning and they cross-reference it to make sure that the items are not on the shelves. After being sent two automated emails, patrons will receive an email from me that's sent through the media library account asking them to please bring it back. Sometimes our games get returned and something's missing. Instead of panicking, the media staff goes through a quick mental checklist to determine what could have happened. And so we take the following steps. We'll check the bag if the game was returned with a console. We check the console itself. Sometimes the patrons will forget to remove the game. Um, we email the patron, let them know that the game is missing. And then we'll renew the item until it's returned or the issue has been resolved. And if possible, the item will stay checked out to the patron's account. Um, but if it's already been checked in, we will check it out to our problem items account. And if it is truly missing, the lost and paid process begins. The patron can either provide us with a physical replacement or pay a fee. Um, we do prefer replacements because they're easier for us to process and it just allows us to get the missing item back into circulation faster. The procedure for consoles that are missing parts is very similar for when a game is missing from its case, but because these are really high use items, we might temporarily replace a missing cable or a controller with one that's from the reserve shelf so that it can stay in circulation. And we check the game console um, within with the exception of the missing component, which will stay on the patron's account. And because our materials see such high use, it is inevitable that things will break. We have been able to increase the longevity and reduce replacement costs by doing some simple repairs. Internal components are often easily replaced using guidance from repair videos. A common issue with Nintendo Switch Joy-Con controllers is that the, joy the joysticks tend to experience drift. Um, and this means this can sometimes be fixed just by opening up the controller and replacing the, the joystick piece. Uh, there are repair, repair kits that are readily available for online purchase, although the quality does vary. Many of these kits will inclu include the prying tool, tweezers, and screwdrivers. Canned air is another good item to have on hand. If an item is broken, but it's potentially fixable with a simple replacement part, we will try to fix it. It might still end up going in the garbage, but a lot of the times $15 is all you need to get it working again. And then determining the difference between wear and tear from repeated use and negligence is another part of the damage and discards process. If the patron is at fault, the damaged item will stay on their account until they can replace it or pay for it. We have a selection of controllers and peripherals along with popular games that are on our reserve shelf for in-house use. These are circulated out of the front desk and will often go out onto the floor with patrons to help them set up our VR headsets or other peripherals like our steering, steering wheel or joysticks. Students are responsible for returning all of the items that they check out um, back to the front desk when they're finished playing. Faculty can also request course materials to go on the reserve shelf for a period of time, whether it's just a few weeks or for the entire semester. And their students can come in, use the materials in-house for a limited loan period. Um, <clears throat> These are typically films and legacy video games. We do have viewing stations and headsets that students can use since not everyone 
has a DVD, Blu-ray, or definitely not a VHS player at home anymore. We have a wide range of gaming and film equipment, and that means a lot of cords and adapters. It's really important that we keep these easily accessible and organized. Cord loss is inevitable, and we see them as consumables and include them in our yearly budget. Patrons are not charged for damaged cords unless there's clear negligence involved. And we encourage all of our staff to have at least a rudimentary level of technical know-how of cables for troubleshooting purposes. The first part of space and equipment management is a general walkthrough done hourly by our student assistants. This allows them to pick up any random items that may have been left out in the game space, and then they can note any damage. On return, the items are wiped down with an isopropyl alcohol and water mixture before they are reshelved. This includes our headsets, equipment, and game and DVD cases. Deep cleaning is done periodically. We will often grab a set of controllers during our quieter moments, do a thorough cleaning into all of the grooves that might have been missed earlier. And we also will set aside time to deep clean our spaces each semester. And this includes dusting, vacuuming, and wiping down areas that we don't always have time for during our busy hours, like between the keyboard keys and behind our PC monitors. We also will take this time to replace any peeling or kind of gross barcodes and our plastic covers get cleaned inside and out. So I spend a good portion of my week troubleshooting equipment and our PCs. Equipment problems go into the problem items tray, while our PC issues are tracked um, by emailing the media library account as well as updating our GameStation issues spreadsheet. Student assistants have several steps that they can take before they escalate problems to me. And um, some ex examples of ex issues that I experience daily are Valorant won't load on PC 14, or there's no space left on PC on the PS4, there's too many user accounts on the Xbox, the Vive won't connect, or there's no sound coming out of these headphones. And most of these issues can easily be solved without uh, needing to be escalated to me. And much of our troubleshooting is really unplugging and replugging the cables or just restarting the device. And if I cannot solve the issue myself, I will go ahead and submit a tech ticket. So the problem tray is where all of the items that just seem broken, missing parts, need to be resurfaced, have been misplaced or are just generally confusing live. And my goal is to get these things off of the problem tray within one week of being placed there. The first step of troubleshooting equipment is this tray. Items are checked out to the problem items account and then they are placed in the tray with a note outlining the issues and the date that they occurred. Our student assistants will test items at least twice to confirm whether damage exists or if it was just user error. To avoid any user error from our own staff, these tests are conducted by two separate people. And if the problem cannot be resolved through these tests, I will try additional troubleshooting, repairs, or make the decision to replace it. All of our PCs are deep frozen, so they can reset to the same configuration and log out and restart. And this deep freeze affects each game's ability to download a required digital rights management executable. The library technology department created an intermediary password for the staff to be able to manage some processes without needing this top admin password. And this password allows us to download the executables and handle smaller PC issues without unduly affecting network security. So I am the point person for the media library when it comes to submitting tickets for technical issues. Our library technology department supports all of the UNT libraries and they're typically pretty busy. Having a designated contact person avoids any confusion and it streamlines our support process. Once we have exhausted our ability to troubleshoot in-house, I will submit um, a technical ticket for additional IT support. Some reasons that I might submit a ticket include software updates, something is broken, or maybe Valorant just isn't loading. And there are a few steps involved in the tech ticketing process. So first I submit the ticket online through one of our portals. I will then be contacted by the technician. They can either remote into the PC or if the issue is more complex, um, like a console, they'll come in uh, physically to look at it. Um, once this issue has been resolved, the ticket is then closed. 
The media library is an active, high-traffic environment, and many of our patrons are really passionate gamers. Occasionally, we will see some negative behavior in the space, um, or patrons just disregarding our library policies, and in those cases, there are certain actions that we can take. In order to use our space and check out items, students are required to follow the UNT Student Code of Conduct, as well as the library's patron code of conduct. Disregarding any element of these policies can result in the refusal of library services. And here's just an excerpt um, from the library's patron code of conduct, which extends to all libraries on campus. So what is disruption in the media library? This behavior can look like leaving games, cords, controllers out in the space, not returning them, um, loud or offensive language, using a second email to book extra time, not making a reservation and ignoring, ignoring staff requests to do so, staying after their reservation time has ended, and just forgetting that this is not their house and taking their shirts off because it's too warm. And in these situations, the media library responds in the following way. We will ask the student for their ID and record their name and ID number. A detailed description of the incident is written down in our disruptive student spreadsheet, and this helps us track any repeat offenders or actions that were taken in the past. And our warning system starts with a verbal warning, followed by an email from me, and then a temporary suspension from LibCal booking services. Any egregious behavior like breaking equipment, fighting, sexual harassment, or stalking is referred to the media library department head who can then escalate this to the dean of students. And only under these circumstances can students be trespassed or banned from the media library. And this is very rare, and it's really only happened once in the last 20 years. Really, for the most part, our patrons are great and they follow the rules. So this was just a brief overview of my week. It's really hard to predict how each day is gonna go because as much as we plan, there are a lot of situations that arise and we just have to react to them in the moment. And the key to success is having a team who supports and communicates well with each other. So things would really not run as smoothly without our media access services manager and the student assistants that she manages and Diane who manages all of our game collections. Okay. We are ready for questions. Thank you. I see y'all have right. a lot. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. So I've, so I've got them all down here. I will try to go through them. Uh, first, we have Liz asking, uh, is there library sponsorship for the esports team or is it someone else on campus? Um, the esports team is part of rec recreational sports. So they are a varsity esports team and they do have um, non-varsity teams. They are managed through recreational sports. We do work together with them. And actually the sponsorships that they pull in as an esports team are benefiting us with materials. So every now and then we do get supplies through them for our spaces. Um, they are actually really a well-known a well -known team and a good team across the US. So actually that's going really well for both of us. Cool. And a similar question, um, since you mentioned a lot of different student organizations, are librarians allowed to be faculty advisors to those organizations? Yes. Yes, and that's how um, that's how we got our money from student affairs. As I was faculty Whoa. advisor to the student esports group, and the president um, had an initiative to bring esports to campus, and nobody had a space, but we did. Um, so then, because we had a space, um, they gave us two hundred thousand dollars to develop our space. So so we went from a small sort of cobbling together a gaming space into a full gaming space by our student organization relationships. And I would say our space is what it is mostly from our networking and relationships we have built on campus. It is a huge part. Um, it can it can take a lot of time and it can be meeting a lot of nights and weekends doing things, but it has really benefited the collection as a whole. Great. Uh, next one, and it's kind of multi-part, so choose to answer these however you will. Um, Charla asks, how do you incorporate DEI into this? And also via the escape rooms, is it a system or do you, uh, or when you attend and if it's something they attend, do you create them or is it someone else who creates the escape rooms? Um, for the DEI items, we provide materials and then people on campus can come check them out for our space. So it's mostly games that support um, 
people thinking a different way, showing different viewpoints. Um, so we are not running the actual events in our spaces unless someone else is is collaborating with us. Um, so it's really just making those materials available to everyone on campus. Um, for the escape rooms, yes, we do design escape rooms and we mm -hmm. have two full escape rooms designed. We have some online escape rooms we've designed and we're working on one now with all our free time. Um, we love designing them. We're getting ready to run a full week of escape rooms for National Library Week and we're running a lot of campus staff through. Um, it's great. It's also exhausting and it's fun, <laughs> but it's a way a lot of um, us have backgrounds in liberal arts and art and communication. It's a good way to start being able to do that. We do share some designs on the library guide that's listed on the this slide, last slide. Cool. Um, do students bring their own consoles and or uh, controllers into the space? And if so, do you ever have issues interfacing non-library equipment with your equipment? They cannot plug into our network, but they can bring their own consoles. We do have several stations they can plug into. Sometimes they do them wherever they want, and that's us managing the cables later because they unplug things. We do have switches at each station, um, so they can plug into a switch and, and get to the TV. Um, they cannot plug into our network. All the network ports are locked to the MAC address for each console, and it's just a security issue. So um, they would either have to go use our Wi-Fi, so they can get into the Wi-Fi. And we also will have a, a lot of students um, will provide, bring their own mouses, keyboards, they bring their own um, mouse pads, um, and we just ask that they plug everything back in afterwards um, when they're using our PCs, but sometimes they don't, and we're like, why is this not hooked up? So we have to troubleshoot. Sure. Uh, what methods do you use to market everything you do? Um, well, I mean, we do, we have a... a marketing team in the library so we're lucky and that we do have that so make they make posters we have tweet we tweet out what we do we market through our discord channel um signs on campus are really putting a sign on campus is probably our best marketing um but it's just getting the word out through those those areas all right uh casey asks do you make use of film and video streaming databases uh, to round out your AV collections? And if so, which ones? Yes, um, that's probably another presentation someone could do. We yeah. do, we have what, Swank, ASP, um, Alexander Street Press. Um, we have Canopy. Canopy. Canopy is probably the, the most popular one. Um, and all students have, through their media, um, through their UNT email accounts, they can access all of them. Some of them, we have them um, in our catalog. So it's listed as um, as like a record, um, but yeah, they can also just go directly to the website and search that way. And if, if it's accessible, they'll be able to play it. It's about 80,000 streaming records through those systems and, and individual titles, but we also have a really big physical collection of about 20,000 DVDs and 20,000 more VHS and then some laser discs. So we have, we have quite, it's an old collection it started in the seventies, but it's a big physical collection as well. Right. Um, Melly asks, does the short amount of time for circulation affect the video games you collect? And I guess they were sort of referring to three days seems too short for longer. I I still games. collect everything. So we we purchase what people want to play and what people need for class. I've not heard complaints, Emily. I don't know if people are complaining. I'm not up at the front desk enough to know. They don't seem to be. No, I haven't heard any complaints. People just, I mean, they'll take them, they'll renew them. Yeah. I think sometimes they're playing to see if they want to purchase yeah. their own copy. Like if I was going to play Elden Ring, I would probably play it some, do I want it? And then go purchase it. Yeah. I mean, um, theoretically, I as long as there's, as no one has placed a hold, I feel like students don't realize that they can place holds. And whenever I'm at the front desk, I always try to remind them like, oh, this is a popular game. Place a hold. You'll be automatically notified when it comes in. Um but yeah, if they if there's no one on hold, they can theoretically just like renew it indefinitely. It's more of the consoles that people kind of complain about because they're really popular and they're we often won't have them um, in the back stacks if someone wants to check it out in the moment. So they do need to place a hold on it. Um, but yeah, I think with games, um, I haven't heard any complaints about our the loan checkout period. And the three items thing, they can still take a console, a remote, mm -hmm. and three games. We don't yeah. say just three total. Like, you get three cables. Like, we do let them take enough to play what they need to play. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't let them take three consoles, though, unless they were a student group. Student groups could take three consoles. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Uh, kind of tying into that, um, for the consoles especially, do you have generic library accounts for patrons to use, or do they need to create their own with the platform? Not we related. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. and they have a follow related. <laughs> if they have, if you have library accounts, do they have digital titles for them, or is it exclusively physical? We have physical titles. We have not purchased any digital only um, titles. We are looking at purchasing digital only for coursework. Students use their own accounts. And because all of the consoles and PCs are networked, they can go into the cloud and play their own content. We do ask them to save into the cloud. One of the things Emily mentioned was us removing accounts. We remove games that mm -hmm. if their save is on there, there's no guarantee they'll come back next time and their game will still be there. Yeah. Um, so they do save in the cloud, they play in the cloud. Everything they play digital, they own. Um, they do mm -hmm. have their own subscriptions. We do have a subscription to update and manage because a lot of times if a console's broken, like parental settings, please set your parental settings. We've had people set them on us to go in and get those removed or take care of, of things. You do have to have an account, but that account is only to manage the system. It mm -hmm. is not to purchase content. All right. And they can use, um, on the consoles at least, they can use our our general like media library account if they don't have their own just to like play and we'll log in for them. But they there's no ability to purchase because nothing's there's no credit card or anything saved on there. Um, but yeah, most people do, and it's really easy to just like make a username um, and just like a, a profile. All right. Um, how does your circulation system link with LibCal for reservations? It doesn't. <laughs> So LibCal is separate. We do have QR codes mm -hmm. and they can just scan it and make the reservation. It, it's a little bit of a learning process. We just switched to LibCal in the fall. We had a different system, um, but they're learning it and they're using it. Um, they use their phones and scan the QR code. Um, LibCal does require a check-in. So we do, we had some issues with people not checking in and losing their spot, but now we've changed where they can check in right at the desk and we check mm -hmm. them in. Um, and it's just statistical reporting for us as well for those seats. Um, and we try to let them know you need to log in and reserve and check in and, and be there so we can count you so we can get new PCs. Like it really is so we can continue what we're doing. Perfect. Uh, and then the last one that I have, at least for now, uh, do you provide food when hosting events? Do you have preferences for what you serve, taking into account preservation and cleanliness uh, of the collection? We serve popcorn, so no, cleanliness is not taken into consideration. We did used to purchase a lot of food pre-COVID, and we purchased water. Um, we don't purchase water anymore just because of the waste. We do have, um, UNT is a sustainability group, so each semester they'll come in and hand out free UNT water bottles. So we hand those out and hope that they fill those up. Mm -hmm. um, and we, uh, we used to purchase food, but after COVID... Our first event, a live event after COVID felt like we were a super spreader, a perfect place for viruses. <laughs> I was like, you know what? Let's just serve popcorn. So now we just, because we have a, a popcorn machine, so we serve popcorn and then we have them use their own water bottles. A lot of times they get really thirsty and realize they need water bottles after we give them popcorn. Yeah. And we we'll wipe popcorn, stuff down. Our popcorn machine is like one of those cool, like, um, kind of almost like circusy one so it looks neat and it will have a when we know we are having an event like this afternoon we have a tabletop time event so in a little bit we'll have students just pop a bunch of popcorn um, and then we have little bags that they can take so it's pretty contained we do have rules generally about um, not having food or drink at the consoles or at the pcs but because we have those general tables in the space um, people can eat there. People will like bring lunch and eat there sometimes. Um, during our events, though, it's a little more lax, but we're just serving popcorn. Great. Well, that's all the questions I wrote down while you were talking. And there was one more that popped in, but someone in the chat answered it. So that's cool. Um, I will kind of call out if there are any other questions. Go ahead and feel free to type those in the chat. And while you all are doing that, I am going to grab the link for anyone needing a certificate for attendance today. And I'll drop that in the chat for you. Let's see. 
And so we're starting to get some thank yous. Yep, lots of those. Uh, I will happily stick around for a little longer if people have questions. Uh, Lisa, you can go ahead and stop the recording.